This is the business end of a Bunsen burner, and this is a flame that's approximately 1500 degrees Celsius. This is a flower, something that under any normal circumstances would be quickly incinerated being directly above this flame. But these are not normal circumstances, because in between is something that is not a normal material. This is the story of aerogels. An aerogel is not really one material, but rather a class of materials consisting of an interconnected solid network that is highly porous. In terms of composition, they can be made of many different elements. Silica aerogels, like the one we saw protecting our flower, are among the most popular, but other oxide or carbon-based aerogels are common as well. Regardless of what the network is, what makes them special is what's in between the air. Aerogels are almost entirely air, but making a material that is mostly, well, not material, is not as easy as it seems. Perhaps contrary to what you might expect, the trick to making an aerogel isn't necessarily creating this interconnected network. That's fairly straightforward chemistry if we use what's known as the Sol gel process. We start with a silica precursor like this, tetramethoxysilane, which consists of silicon bonded to four methoxy groups. In a solution containing water, our methyl group can be replaced by hydrogen, then can form bridging bonds to make larger molecules, and this process gets repeated until we have silicon nanoparticles in solution, called a sol. These nanoparticles, if they reach a critical concentration, will start to stick to each other and condense, making a gel. Sol, gel, you get the picture. There are a million subtleties to this method that we could discuss, but the point is that this is fairly basic chemistry. We now have a highly porous, interconnected network in solution. Surprisingly, this is where the hard part begins. Replacing this liquid with air is almost impossible. You've probably heard of capillary action before, and that's the real enemy here. You can see clear examples of it in sponges or small tubes of water. In an aerogel, the effect is even more pronounced because our pores are much smaller. Our liquid really wants to stay within the pores of this gel, but if we start simply evaporating it, there's a very powerful force pulling inward and tugging on the structure. It shrinks more and more as it dries. You can see the same effect if you leave jello uncovered in the fridge for too long. This uncontrolled evaporation usually ends up collapsing the entire structure if we let it run to completion. The resulting powder, typically called a zero gel, still retains some porosity and is of use in certain applications, but it's a far cry from the nice solid brick we saw in the intro. This is a problem with no easy solution. Imagine being given a full glass of water and told to empty it, but that at no point in your process can you have an air-water interface within the glass. There's simply nothing we can do with conventional methods. There is a trick we can play with physics to eliminate the liquid-gas interface and subsequent capillary forces, though, and to do so, we must go supercritical. Beyond the normal ranges of pressures we deal with in everyday life, there is a set of conditions where the distinction between liquid and gas vanishes. A supercritical fluid has both liquid and gas-like properties. It is compressible like a gas, but has high density and can solvate more like a liquid. That solvating power is what can be exploited to dry our gel in a non-destructive way. In theory, any solvent can be used for this as long as it's supercritical. But in practice, this is a tough sell with typical organic solvents. Ethanol, for example, won't go supercritical until about 240 degrees Celsius. And I don't think I need to explain how having a highly flammable solvent under high pressure and high temperature is something that should be avoided if possible. Carbon dioxide, by contrast, is much more inert and has a critical temperature that's only 31 C. Liquid CO2 is also miscible with stuff like ethanol and acetone, 
So a typical drying process might go something like this. At low temperature in a pressurized vessel, we have our gel immersed in ethanol, then exchange the solvent for CO2 by simply flushing the chamber a few times. Then the temperature can be increased a bit to make the CO2 supercritical, and finally we can slowly vent the CO2 to atmospheric pressure, eventually exchanging with air in the process. Voila! With just a few unconventional moves along a phase diagram, we have removed our liquid without ever crossing the liquid gas boundary. The gel can then be calcined to make it crystalline and more mechanically robust. We now have a true aerogel, a freestanding solid that is almost entirely air. Their unique structure makes these aerogels have some truly remarkable properties. As you might be able to guess, the flower demonstration and other similar feats are facilitated by the extremely low thermal conductivity of aerogels. You see, an aerogel's pores are quite small, so small that they can be smaller than the mean free path of air molecules. In this regime of tiny pores, we observe a phenomenon known as the Knudsen effect, where diffusivity of a gas decreases, dramatically reducing thermal conductivity along with it. Long story short, this material simply refuses to move heat. An aerogel can be even more thermally insulating than the gas it contains. And unlike thermally insulating polymeric materials like styrofoam, an aerogel can sit comfortably at extremely high temperatures. This has led to the most widespread commercial use of aerogels in many insulating materials that also require resistance to high temperatures. While being thermally insulating is probably the most well-known property of aerogels, it is far from their only party trick. The extreme porosity means they're also the lightest freestanding solids on Earth. A silica aerogel in a vacuum has a density of around 1,000 grams per meter cubed, literally lighter than air. Recently, a graphene aerogel took this a step further at a truly unfathomable 160 grams per meter cubed. Here it is comfortably sitting over a flower. I promise this isn't turning into a botany channel. I guess flowers and aerogels just work together. To put that density number into perspective another way, an entire full-size shipping container packed with this stuff would weigh a bit over 10 kilos. Another fun aspect of aerogels is that their ultra-high surface area and tunable surface chemistry lets them do some unique things. Oxide aerogels are typically hydroxyl terminated, but by changing the conditions to substitute these with methoxy groups, they go from hydrophilic to hydrophobic. And I mean extremely hydrophobic. That's right, folks. Aerogels have the power to literally make water not wet. The numerous exposed surfaces of aerogels also make them attract research interest for a great number of emerging applications. Everything from catching bits of comets, to oil spill cleanup, to neutralizing chemical warfare threats. As you might expect, a big drawback of aerogels that limits their commercial viability is simply their price. The complex fabrication process makes them rather expensive, but even that is not the deal breaker that it once was. The supercritical drying process that we discussed earlier still generally produces the best silica aerogels, but for carbon variants, freeze-drying is a viable alternative, which takes another route around the phase diagram to avoid the liquid gas boundary. There are even routes developed to dry aerogels in more conventional ways without inducing the typical structural collapse. While the porosity of these aerogels still typically falls short of the supercritically dried flavors, for commercial applications it often makes sense to sacrifice a bit of quality for a lot of affordability. Overall, aerogels are the epitome of how science can sometimes be indistinguishable from sorcery. They're truly one of a kind, holding a slew of world records and pulling off feats that make them the easiest clickbait of the materials world. It's not all for show either, because although you don't see aerogels every day, when you do see them, it's often because they're truly the only material that can do the job. They may be almost entirely air, but the remaining 1% gives aerogels a truly special story to tell.